Gentlemen, welcome back to the T. Shanley starting a business, building a brand vlog. This one, big number, 280. See this thing? You know what this is? <laughs> it's actually like a therapy thing. So I've been dealing with tennis elbow. Oh my God. Like if you guys out there that have ever dealt with like tennis elbow or golfer's elbow, I had that for a while. It is incredibly painful. It's going on like a few months. I'm even going to like therapy for it. And it's not helping because I'm such a bonehead and I just want to like keep lifting and doing everything. Anyway, this video is not about my tennis elbow. It is, however, about you and your business. Before we dive into your incredible business questions, I want to tell you a quick little update on Tiege Hanley. We are kicking some serious ass again, which is great to see. Um, we've had sort of a rough, not rough, when I say rough, it's all relative, right? We had some hurdles to get over, um, and it looks like we are really starting to sort of right the ship into the right direction, and it is incredible to see. Something else that was really awesome yesterday, um, T T one of the things that we have struggled with for Tiege Hanley is that top funnel video, right? Um, it's, and, and top funnel video is basically that like video that's like kind of like an advertisement that you run on, on Facebook, on Instagram, on pre-roll, on YouTube, like you run it. And basically, you know the deal, it's like the Dollar Shave Club, right? It's this, this top funnel video that people see and it gets people high level down into the T. Janley funnel. Well, we have struggled creatively. We've also struggled with messaging over the years. We did one video a long time ago that for those of you who have been watching a, a while, we did it, we listened to this agency, it cost like $40,000 for us to do this like high level production and it was a fail. As soon as we saw it, it was like, this is super stupid because there's a fine line between being funny and being really stupid. And a lot of these agencies are trying to duplicate or replicate the Dollar Shave Club, you know, the Squatty Potty, all of these like lightning in a bottle like concepts. They're trying to just like plug and play and, and trying to repeat it. And it just, none of it's funny anymore. And it looks kind of desperate and just kind of, kind of stupid. So anyway, so this is something that we have struggled with. We have struggled with messaging. Like, what is that message? What is that, what is that thing that's going to resonate with our potential consumer that's going to get them to, to check it out? That's still, I think, funny or fun, or I should say entertaining, but not in a, a tongue-in-cheek, stupid kind of way, stupid humor like you're seeing so often nowadays. So last night, Kelly and I were sort of talking and bouncing some ideas off each other, and I, he came up with this, like, okay, so it's been, it's been a, we've been talking about this internally, Kelly, Rob, and myself, for a while, right? And I have an idea for some, some concepts. Kelly, when I talked to him last night, I was like, hey, so what is your, what is your thoughts? What are you feeling? Because we definitely need that top-level video or some collateral that we can use and that messaging. Because once you figure out what that messaging is to confer to sale or to get people interested in T. Shanley, then you can replicate that, that concept. And the idea is that we want to be able to find a concept that is true to our brand, but still also engages with our targeted audience, which is, which is you guys. And so last night, Kelly and I were sort of talking. We came up with some ideas and concepts. And Kelly said, you got to ask the gentleman. You got you to throw this out on the vlog to see if these guys would be able to help us come up with these like little like situations that are, anyway, we're going to do this. I think next week, we're going to run like some type of like contest where, you know, one of the ways that we, we have engaged you over the years is whenever we need something, like whether or not it's, it's choosing our coloring for our packaging or t-shirt design, we like coming to you because you guys are a lot smarter and more creative than us oftentimes. And so we've got this idea for the concept, but we need situations that I'm going to ask you probably next week to be a part of. So you guys can just submit your situation. And if yours is selected, when we actually film it, the idea, the idea is to actually fly you to where, when we're doing like your concept and you'll meet like the whole team, possibly me, if I go up for it, I probably will go up for it. Uh, hopefully I'll go up for it. But the idea is that we want to engage you and, and, and have you be a part of of our, uh, of our story and the development of these, these sort of top funnel videos and concepts. So still a work in progress, but I just wanted to come on and give you a quick little update. Things are good. Things are really good. Very exciting time at Tiege Hanley. We had a big presentation to a company. We'll tell you about that a little bit later. And we got another call with them next week. 
lots of good stuff happening. So now what I would like to do is dive into your amazing business questions. Now, if you got a business question, you got to start it with business question and ask it. This vlog is all about you. It's all about helping you. It's all about dropping knowledge and value based on the fact that we have done a lot of things, we've screwed a lot of things up, and if we can help you avoid some of the speed bumps and pitfalls in business or entrepreneurship, we wanna help. So if you've got a business question, it doesn't matter what it is, down below, ask it. Today we got a bunch of them I'm gonna dive into. The first one is actually from two vlogs ago, and that is about enemy sunglasses, and why, when I launched this, they were $150 per sunglass, but then before the weekend was over, boom, I dropped my price below $100, $95. Why did I do it? And what was the strategy? How did it happen? Today, I'm gonna to tell you the story about that initial launch of Enemy, what happened, what I did, why I did it, and sort of that situation. Why don't we start there and, and, and then we'll get to more of your business questions, shall we? So the full business question is from our friend, Rusty Shackelford. He says, when you launched Enemy, the initial price was $150, but you almost immediately dropped the price to just under 100. What was the reason? What are the lessons learned in that launch? Finally, can you talk about pricing products or services and any given advice or, or give any advice on that? All right, so here's the situation with Enemy. When I decided to make these sunglasses, I wanted to make a super high quality pair of sunglasses that normally would sell or retail for around that $300 to $400 price point. But I wanted to sell them for an even better price. And so when we ended up developing and designing them, because they are a custom design, I didn't just go to a factory and stamp a logo on it, we had a choice of what components to use. And so for these sunglasses, much like these other super premium high-end designer glasses, we use Italian Mazzacholi, I think I butchered the name of that, but Mazzacholi acetate from Italy. Acetate is not plastic, it's actually a live like compound, it's pretty incredible. And it, it actually smells like olive oil. When you, when you get a pair of like enemy sunglasses and you pull them out of the package, give them a smell. They have a smell. That's the smell of acetate. And personally, I love the smell. The other thing we did, spring hinges. Um, also, the big thing was the Zeiss lenses. Zeiss lenses and Zeiss it, optics are top of the line. Like in terms of like there is nothing better than Zeiss. And so when we, we did these sunglasses, I'm like, okay, that is the, the product that I wanna, I wanna make. Instead of 300 or 400, I think we should come in at around $150. It was like 50% less than these should be or would be sold at retail. I also wanted to use like high-end like packaging. I wanted the, the boxes to be like super cool. They were like originally like black velvet. We changed that because velvet is a nightmare. Nice cloths, nice boxes, like the packaging and the presentation. We wanted to all be like super luxe and high-end and it was. Some other things that I did in terms of with Enemy and trying to really build it as a premium lifestyle brand was like the website, right? I spent, I think it was like $43,000 on the domain enemy.com. But I did that because I believed in the brand and I believed that if I'm gonna be selling a premium product, I need the experience to be premium. And so we got our inventory and the other thing you need to understand and, and a lot of people don't uh, is that, that when you use like premium quality products or, or components to something, even if it's being assembled in China, it's still not like a five, these aren't like $5, $10, $15 sunglasses. Yes, there are a lot of them out there that are cheap, cheap and low, low quality, but these are not like a low priced product. Like, like landed, I'm not gonna ex exactly tell you how much they cost me landed, but it's not like under $30 or anything like that. Unfortunately, if it was, that'd be better. But when I originally ordered the inventory, I didn't go like crazy overboard. I had a few different styles. I wasn't sure what was gonna sell, what wasn't gonna sell. So I went a little bit lower on the order volume because it was a new product, a new business. I had no idea. And as a result of that, the price per unit also went up. And so decided, all right, here we go, getting ready to launch. I did some you know, pre-selling, had people signed up, and we launched at that like $150 price point option. Now, going into that, I was still not sure what the price point really should be. But in my head, I thought to myself, okay, if I do this weekend $300,000 in sales, my price is right. Where I came up with that number, I have no idea. It was just the number that I came up with, and I thought if I do 300 grand, in like three days, it's the right price. So we launched it, we emailed people, and we sold a ton of sunglasses. But 
it wasn't $300,000. It was around $150,000. And I thought, okay, something's up. And then I started reading the comments from the post. They're like, oh, it's too expensive. It's too expensive. And I said, all right, this price is not right. I need to get this thing under $100. And so I hopped on. I, I didn't call. I emailed because with China, it's all like emails. And I said, all right, I knew sort of like the price breakdown in terms of if I ordered this volume, this is what I'd be, or where I would be at in terms of my cost. I knew that I could get the cost down significantly, not as significantly as the 30% price drop, but I decided two different things. I was going to A, I was going to commit, I was going to order more units in order to get the prices down. I was also going to pre-order lenses from Zeiss. That is, and, and the lenses for this product is the big like bottleneck because it takes a few months to actually produce the lenses. And so instead of going like just for the order that I'm placing, I ended up buying a larger order of lenses to get the prices down for, for the lenses, for the, the glasses that I had and the glasses I was going to be making in the future. I also decided to eat margin and actually make less on the sunglasses. And so, you know, it was, it was a, it was a multi-prong approach, but what I did was I identified that like super quick and knew that it was not the right, right price. I knew that if I got it under a hundred dollars at 95, I could probably sell more and make up for the amount of money I was gaining by selling it at $150. It's all about, it's all, it's all the, it's, it's math, it's numbers, right? If you think that you can exponentially increase the amount of sales, and even though you're not making as much per unit, you think that you can actually sell that much more in order to compensate and actually make more money because you're moving more units, that is the decision that you ultimately had to make. And so when I decided that, it was literally after like a day and a half, I ended up um, refunding every single person that bought the sunglasses, I refunded them whatever the difference was in terms of you know, the difference between what they paid and $95, plus a discount. <laughs> I think I even threw like a discount code in there. And so I knew that it was gonna be a huge pain in the ass, it was gonna be a huge customer service nightmare, but I couldn't come on and say, hey, I know you guys you know, that, that were the early adopters and believed in me, you spent 150, but a week later I'm like, ah, it's 95, sorry, thanks though. I needed to give the money back. It was an easy decision, it was the right call, and so I did that. And that's kind of the story. Enemy is a hard business. You know, sunglasses, it was my first for, foray, is that the word? Anyway, it was my first time making you know, a product like sunglasses. And it's challenging. I didn't realize all the nuance about sizing and the fact that people are gonna, you know, not like a size. And it, it, it's a complex business that does require a lot of capital to maintain any type of inventory or levels of inventory. Because say, you know, just use, like if, if a pair of sunglasses cost me $40 landed, you know, and you have a thousand, right? That's $40,000 for like one style that you have tied up in inventory. And until you sell that, that inventory, you're not getting that money out. And so it is, a, it, is a, it is a heavy cash requirement. It's also just challenging. It's different. You know, I didn't realize, you know, the seasonality with this, but um, it's been a learning experience. One that has had goods, good times. It's also had bad times. And we're still in the process, honestly, of figuring it out. It is doing well. It's not doing as amazing as I would hope it would, but you know, I'm kind of spoiled because you know, Tish Hanley was a rocket ship. Pete and Pedro wasn't a rocket ship, but it now's kind of like grown because of some things we're doing. So, so enemy is is something that I'm still having. I'm having to break rocks, as they say. I'm having to work extra hard in order to do it. But that's kind of what you do when you're still figuring out the market, figuring out the marketing, figuring it out, figuring out the business. But, uh, but yeah, so that's the story. I hope you got some value out of that. If not, it's still the story. This next question comes from our friend, Asama A. What's up, brother? Thanks for hanging out with us here on this vlog. He says, I have an idea for a non-alcoholic drink and want to start a beverage company. Just to let you know, beverage companies are tough. That is a tough market. It is a tough industry. Just, throw, just throwing that out there. You need to really educate yourself about the industry before you commit to, I'm not saying not to do it, but you better do your research. Um, one of the things that we, we had done at uh, Area 627, the, the company that I do where we get, you know, and potentially invest in things, we've had two beverage companies that have approached us 
a beverage, that's, 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 a, that's a hard thing because it's really expensive to ship, you know, because it's heavy, you need a lot of shells. Like it, it's, it's a tough, I'm not trying to talk you out of it. Let's, let's get to your question. I reached out to a few beverage development companies and they are happy to work with me on the formulation, but the cost is about 15,000 to 20,000 just for the development, which is expensive. Do you think there's a better alternative like formulation consultants, for example? I know Tej has a formulation partner, but what would you do if you had no partner and how would you handle it? So, so this is a great question. Great question. You know, beverage companies, yes, they will help you out. Skincare companies, grooming companies, they will help you out. These labs will help you. But if you're not coming to them with something to actually massage and, and you know, figure out, it can be expensive. T. Janley, from day one, we had a chemist. That was like kind of like part of our secret sauce. We had a guy who was incredible at skincare and formulations, and he was a rock star. So like at his home, he had all the components, and he was you know like a mad scientist, ha mad handsome scientist, mixing things and testing things and sending them to us to try. By the time we took our formula to a lab to actually say, this is what we want you to make, and they looked at the ingredients and saw the actual formulation, the thing they said to us and the thing that we always like will repeat because it's kind of like a feather in our cap is, do you realize what you have here? And we're like, no. He's like, these are Ferrari formulas, meaning like super premium, and you're selling them for what? And so that being said, we have had him. Now, that being said, there are other products that he might not necessarily be or have a skill set in. And so depending on the lab that you are going to, if you go to them and say, I want to make this, you could even give them like a sample. Like I want to make, like if there's a, a beverage that you're kind of like, modeling or replicating or tweaking. Maybe it's something where this is the base formula. I want to add this or remove this. So you're actually bringing something of substance that their chemist can just kind of like deconstruct and re recreate. I think that might be an easier thing as opposed to starting from like zero. Long time ago, long time ago, I, I made a, a fat burning supplement back when I was at the nutrition store. And I went and it was a custom formulation. I think it literally cost probably back in the day like $5,000. And you know, I went with, with, a, with a sample or a product. I said, this is what I have, but I want to add more L-carnitine. I want to add this, that, and the other thing in order to make it a better product. And they did that, but they had a base, they had a formulation sort of to start with. And so other than that, I don't really know what the other options are because with a product like this, a beverage, you might be able to try like whipping things up in your kitchen if you have the skill set, but most likely you don't. You definitely are going to need to have somebody that's going to help you. And you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars—that's that's expensive. But I would definitely, I would definitely sort of start start looking around. And also, before you do that, you need to really understand the business to make sure that the business, excuse me, or potential industry you're going into is the right fit because I'm here to tell you, not trying to steal your thunder, but the beverage industry is hard. Watch Shark Tank. Every time a beverage company's on there, they always talk about, I hate beverage companies, or beverage is hard, or whatever. But watch it, because they're gonna give you some more insight in the industry and why it's so tough and challenging. The second business question comes from our friend, Lil Monster. What's up, brother? And I love this question. He says, one quick question. So what do you think about taking money from parents for a potential business? I'm 19 and I have a job. My family is somewhat wealthy, but I just want to uh, get to the top. By the way, you're really inspirational. Just wanted to say thank you. So do you take money from your parents? Yeah. I think if they're interested in helping you, why not? This isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, you have an advantage over a lot of people. And so what are you going to do? Be like, uh, you know, I could get, because the, the truth is, your parents are the ones that are going to want to support you and believe in you. Now. I am not a fan of people that are sort of, you know, suckling from the parental financial teat, as they would say, all their life. But if you are an entrepreneur and you are, there are a lot of amazingly successful entrepreneurs that got a little help from their parents because their parents had money. Because access to cash is not an easy thing to get. But if your parents are willing to help you fund your business or your idea, but just make sure that 
you know, it's not like three years, five years, 10 years, and you're still getting money from your parents because they're going to get annoyed. They're going to get pissed off. And really, if you can't make something work from the investment that they give you, then it's probably not the right business or the right investment. But at 19 years old, how else are you going to get money if you want to start your business? Just be sure that you don't take it for granted. And I guess that's probably the hardest thing, right? Because it was given to you. You didn't, you know, you do have a job, but in order to start, like, just make sure that you treat that money as if it was yours that you worked for. Because when you look at money and finances from the eyes of, I earn this, typically you're gonna be more responsible and you value it more. But when it's handed to you, a lot of times we'll get sloppy, we'll get lazy, and we'll get careless when it comes to spending money, other people's money, that wasn't like hard for us to get. So, and that's one of the big things that like Kevin O'Leary will say, I want a company that is lean and hungry as opposed to like fat with cash. Because people that are fat with cash, meaning like they raised a bunch of money from outside investment, a lot of times they're very wasteful. And so just don't be wasteful and talk to them. And I would personally work out a thing with them if you want to be taken seriously of repayment. All right? Repay your parents. If you're successful, repay them. Man, there are a lot of business questions, so I'm going to have to speed these answers up. I'm sorry. The next question comes from our friend Rajrishi Paramar. What's up, brother? Good to see you. Thanks for being here. He says, would really love advice on which sports, meets, clubs, hobbies, etc., are great in order to meet some high net worth uh, people to just make good, valuable connections. Great question. Awesome question. Golf. <laughs> Golf is one of those hobbies that you can do. You don't need a lot of money in order to do it, depending on where you're golfing. This is going to you know, be, be a thing, but, but golf is one of those hobbies that a lot of people that are, that are well-connected or successful, they, they, they golf and they meet on the golf course. And so if there was one hobby, I would say it's golf. That's the one. The next business question is something that I have struggled with. I think most people, entrepreneurs have struggled with from time to time. It's from Daniel, Daniel Chudrak. Sorry, I just butchered your name. Anyway, he says, how to find value of your services or your time, not being afraid to ask for payment for your time. I've been struggling with uh, having myself paid. When I do something I like to do, I often forget that I should charge money for it. It also happens uh, happened in my small business where I put everything I made back into the business and didn't pay myself. In short, creating something um, and earning nothing. This is a great question and something that I think a lot of people struggle with because asking for, for money and identifying what your value is is one of the hardest things to do. A lot of times, there are two things that happen. Number one, you undervalue yourself or you do things for free. The other thing that happens is you overvalue yourself. Like a lot of businesses overvalue themselves. One of the things that I learned the hard way is that I used to be a personal trainer. And I was, you know, I knew a lot about like diet and nutrition and workouts. And so what happened, a lot of people would come to me and they would say, hey, I want help on my diet. I want help on my workout. And I'd be like, okay. And I'd take my time and create some plan for them, some program. I'd give it to them and they wouldn't do anything. They didn't value what I was giving them because they didn't have to pay for it. And what ended up happening is I finally realized this. It was like an epiphany. I'm like, wait a second, no. If you want my advice, my time, my expertise, you've got to pay for it. And what that does is it sets a, a roadblock, a barrier. If somebody really finds what you're doing valuable, they're going to pay it because they understand. If they won't, then they just want, wanted something free and they're not worth your time anyway. And so all I, I guess I would say is I understand what you're doing. I understand what you're saying, but you've got to take a stand because if you don't value yourself, nobody else will. It's about that first time that you actually set that, that paywall up and say, hey, yes, I would love to. This is what we're going to do. This is what the fee is going to be. And sit back or send it to them. And if they don't get back to you, they weren't serious. But I think what you're going to find is the first time you get somebody to be like, okay, cool, no problem, and they pay you, done. That's the confidence you need. Good luck. I know it's hard, but you can do it. So this next business question I had to think about for a second. It's from our friend Johnny Burns. He says, I just started a web development company. I need clients. My ideal client is a small business owner or someone who wants an e-commerce store. What would you focus on more, cold calling or Facebook ads? What I would probably do if I were you, first thing you need to do is get, get a few people and, and sort of you know, get people to actually do it so you've got you know, testimonials and referrals. What I would probably do is start going to networking events or 
um, local things, things like, like the Chamber of Commerce, because these are going to be typically small business people, and they're going to be somebody that you can actually talk to in person, explain what you do. Cold calls and emails, yes, it's effective, I'm sure, to some degree, but I think a better use of your time at first is really sort of learning to talk the talk and to network with, with entrepreneurs. Because the other thing is, if you meet somebody and they don't need your service, you can always ask them, say, hey, you know, do you have a referral or do you know anybody that might need my service? And if they say no, okay, great. If they say yes, that's a, that's a foot in the door. And they, then you can actually drop their name. So personally, instead of running like Facebook ads and things of that nature, you can try that, small little budget just to try it. You could send emails, test it, but networking events is probably where I would, where I would focus in my, my small, you know, in my community. But, uh, but you might want to test all three options and just see which one is producing more results and then whichever one does, keep doing that. And, uh, and that's probably how I would do it. But I'm an idiot when it comes to technology. And the last business question comes from our friend Big Schmoo. <laughs> What's up, buddy? Anyway, he says, hey, Aaron, hope you're doing great. My question, I own a pretty successful men's clothing brand in Bavaria, Germany. Since Bavaria is the biggest state in Germany with a lot of very old and proud traditions, we embrace these influences and target specifically to local state customers, which is doing great. However, we're not sure how to expand our brand countrywide or even internationally. Any advice on this? Uh, uh, any advice on should we stick to our system and just add more products? Thanks for the, the help. Um, keep up the great work. So the question, if I'm understanding it, you've got a successful clothing company. Now, I don't know if you are selling wholesale to retailers or it's e-commerce. If it's e-commerce, that kind of changes my opinion. If it's retail and you're actually selling, I see, I don't, I don't know what type, I don't know wh where or how you're selling and I think that's probably the question I need answered in order for me to better direct you because in my mind, if you are selling directly to retailers in your, in your state, wholesale, and they're selling your stuff, and that's your model and your business, then it is, uh, if it's, it, I don't know. I don't know how to tell you to do this because I don't know what your business is, uh, other than a, 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 I just don't know. I'm, I'm struggling here. So what I need is clarification. Down below, why don't you ask again? To specify exactly how you're selling your clothes and what makes it specific to that state. Like, I don't understand the proud tradition. Like, what makes it unique? I, I'm not sure why you wouldn't be able to expand it to other countries or even internationally. I just need more information. So if that is you, your question down below, please explain the business model a little bit better and maybe that'll be a way for me to better understand and direct you so I don't just like throw something out that's absolutely zero value. Gentlemen, that is where I'm going to wrap things up. We love you, of course, more than our dumb monk trap shoes. Thank you so much for rolling with Tiege Hanley. We couldn't do any of this without you. You are the reason why we are the brand that we are. And I just really appreciate you hanging with us. Guys, if you don't mind, drop us one of these. And if you don't mind, if you've got a business question, down below, start it with business question and ask it. It can be about our business, your business, a business you've been thinking about or conceptualizing. It doesn't matter. If it's business related, we got you.